I'm going to read a passage for you now from Luke. This is chapter 1, verses starting at verse 46. This is a song that Mary sings after visiting her, uh, her cousin Elizabeth, glorifying God. And she says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. You can be seated. <clears throat> I completely f forgot to put on my microphone, so we're going to do this stand-up comedy style today. I want you to think in your minds of a word, just one word, you would use to describe your personal experience with 2020. Just one word is all you get. But you gotta pick one. You've only got like about six seconds to do it. Okay. I know for some people it's like tragedy. You can tell your neighbor if you want. What's your word? Tell your neighbor. Share if you want. Since we're basically sitting with family, it shouldn't be too embarrassing. Unless it was something about your spouse. Right? For a, lot, for a lot of people, it would, like, it might be tragedy, because personally, like, this was a very tragic year for you. For me, let me, just, let me just be excessively honest for the sake of communication, exhaustion is my word for this year, okay? Um, and praise God. Let's pray right now. God, it is unbelievable that this last year was the most exhausting year for a lot of us in recent memory. There was no world war. There was no true plague like the Black Plague or like Ebola. There was, we have been so incredibly blessed that this year we consider hard. In all the lives of all people and all generations under the curse, how blessed could we possibly be to be so, to find this last year so difficult? Thank you for a hundred thousand unearned blessings that we called this last year hard. Amen. But I'm still exhausted, right? I'm still exhausted. And, um, and it wasn't so much that I worked more hours this year than any year in my working life, which I did. And a lot, that's true for a lot of you too. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it was just like the emotional and mental of it. It was just like, it was like the changes, the tragedies, the acrimony, the controversies, just constant, 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 constant. You were changing. You're doing something new every minute. I don't know where the clicker is. So I'm going to go like this, guys. Um, but here's one of the things that I, I learned this year, more than maybe any year in my ministry so far, is that emotional and mental exhaustion can very easily lead to spiritual exasperation. Like, as Christians, what you want to believe is going to happen is that because of Jesus, rivers of living water are going to well up in your soul, and they're going to flow like a flood over your emotional and, like, mental difficulties, and you're going to soar with the eagle's wings over all the struggles of your life. And that is— precisely exactly what can happen through the gospel, through the work of Christ, and through the work of the Spirit. However, what most religiously professing people experience, because we are really confused about what faith means, is we're not experiencing that. And what happens is we feel exhausted mentally and emotionally, and all this stuff is happening to us, and we turn to our faith, and we say, why aren't you doing anything? You're supposed to be gushing out rivers of living water. And we turn to God, and we get really upset. Right? It's exactly what was happening in, in the book of Isaiah in chapter 40. God's sending his people into exile. He knows that they're having a difficult time with all of this, and they, they think that they're a people of faith, but they're not. They don't really believe. And so in their hearts, they're complaining and grumbling against God, and God says, why do you guys say about me? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is disregarded by my God. Because that's, you, that's what you're thinking in your hearts. What you're thinking in your heart is, is that if God is even there, um, he doesn't see me, and he doesn't care about me getting justice. He doesn't care that I'm, I'm being mistreated, right? 
That's, that's how people feel really constantly. It's one of the reasons why God had that included in Scripture, right? And God's response to that in Isaiah 40 is very kind, but it's very firm. Right? God stands ready to help us when we feel that way, but not however you want. He stands to help you his way. Right? The first verse in Isaiah 40 is, comfort, comfort my people. Like, that's his desire. His desire is to give comfort, right? But not on the basis of a lie, not on the basis of like admitting he did something wrong when he never did, right? He wants to turn us back to himself. And the, the sort of the heart of his promise relative to this is found in verse 31, where it says, um, but those who wait on the Lord— a lot of the translations put hope in the Lord, but it's more literally wait on the Lord, for the Lord, will renew their strength. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they'll walk and not be faint. When I, when I think about that, um, that verse, the, the, one of the people in the scriptures that exemplify that as much as anybody is Mary. Like, I think about, when I think about that, and I think about what the Israelites said, I think about the Magnificat, where Mary's song. Because Mary believes literally the exact opposite of what the Israels believed in Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 40, the Israelites believed that God didn't see them, and that they didn't, that he didn't care about them getting justice. And in the Magnificat, Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my heart rejoices in God my Savior. Why? Because he has been mindful— of the humble state of his servant, right? Like she says, that one of the reasons why I'm so full of joy right now is because God sees—I know God sees me. I know he—my way is not hidden from him. And then he, she says later, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then he talks about how he lifts up the humble, he lifts up the righteous, and he lifts up the weak, and he tears down the unbelieving of the rich and the powerful and the ruling. And that's what he does. He does that because why? Because he's just. So Mary— believes that. And here's the thing, like, like, Mary was not having a Riviera vacation when she said this, okay? She went and visited Elizabeth. I mean, probably half because she needed to get out of Nazareth the way people were looking at her and talking about her, because everybody knew she was pregnant before she was married, right? She's poor. She's a woman. And her life is not going to get better, okay? She's going to have Jesus. That's probably— a good childhood, maybe. He didn't talk back as a teenager, but like small favors compared to, you know, the day she takes him for a dedication to the temple. You know what she's told? By some like very godly older saints, prophetically? Mary, it's going to be like a heart, like a sword being driven through your chest and through your heart. That's what your life's going to be like with this child. A sword will pierce your own heart. And you know what the Bible says her emotional response to that was? Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Because even that, even that she was going to get gutted emotionally through this whole experience, she believed it was going to mean so much that it was going to be worth it because that was the God that was going to rule over it. Right? So the question is, dear God, how can I be more like her? <laughs> like, I don't want to worship Mary, but I want to venerate her to the highest level possible and it not be bad. Okay, like, I just, I would love to be a lot more like her and how she looked at God, how she thought about God, how she interacted with God, how, how she believed practically, right? And so God, and here's the thing about this, and this is true of almost every spiritual truth. There are no secrets. Like, God has a secret will. There are things in his mind that he's doing that he's not told us. But in terms of, like, how we can thrive, how we can believe, how we can live, how we can love, and, like, God's instruction, there's no secrets. The reason why they seem like secrets, why so many deep spiritual truths seem like secrets, is because they're hard for us to see because of our spiritual blindness. It's not because he doesn't tell us. God tells us in the most urgent, plain, possible language. And Isaiah 40 has the secret of how it is that we can experience when we are worn out, when we're not just emotionally exhausted, but we feel spiritually exasperated, how we can actually experience being so strengthened in that weariness that we feel like we're soaring like an eagle above the canyon of our, of our issues, of our problems, of our struggles, and of our difficulties. That that is possible. That's not just religious clapchap. That is a divine and truthful promise. So, let's, uh, let me read the whole— paragraph for you. God says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my 
cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, have you not heard, that the Lord is the everlasting God, the maker of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Right? Even young men grow tired and weary, and, and youths will stumble and fall, but those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will walk and not run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now think about what he's saying there. What does he mean by those two questions? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Why is that there? Is he, is he a new teacher and trying to get a sense of what his students have already covered? Right? It's not. No, God is being sarcastic in a redemptive and loving way. He's being humiliatingly sarcastic. These are people, they're Jews, right? They've gone to temple their whole life. They've had the Torah. They've heard the whole thing read. If you ask them academically, just so let me ask you, give you a religious quiz. Is God the everlasting God? They would all say, of course he is. If you said, okay, so is he ever going to get tired? They'd be like, no, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay, okay, great. Let me ask you one more. Um, did he create the ends of the earth? Yeah. All right, is he, let me ask you one more. Is he so smart and so wise that you don't know everything that he's thinking, but that he's doing everything well, whether or not you think he is or not? They go, of course. That's so dumb, right? If you ask them in Sunday school, but when they walk out into their life and they operate on the basis of what their deepest heart really believes, they don't believe any of that. Okay, and, and here, why am I talking about these ancient people? It's because you are exactly like them. You and I are exactly like these people. What they assent to in their public belief is not the same thing that rules their core. And they don't act like they believe that there's a God who is supremely omnipotent over them, who could never grow weary, whose, whose knowledge is so keen, his wisdom so complete that he could never do anything, not just not wrong, but not beautiful, not perfect, not the right thing to do in that moment, and that and that because of that, they can trust everything about what he's done, and they can see him as the source of whatever strength that they need, right? They don't believe that. And so he says to them, have you not, do, do you not know? Have you not heard, like, has it, like, never occurred to you? Did you never read? Did no one ever share with you these truths? And the answer is, of course, they've known them since they were children. They've just never believed them, at least since they were adults. And it's the reason why they don't have any strength. It's the reason why they're so weary— it's because there's no river of living water. There's no source of the strength of God really in them. Even though they're religious, they believe, they have faith, they consider themselves spiritual. But because their faith isn't operative, they don't actually believe in the God they say they believe in. Nothing's happening, right? And so he, one of the things he says to them is he says, listen, your biggest weakness is your belief that you're strong. I want you to consider that. That that's true of you and me. I definitely know that's true of me. But I'm pretty sure it's true of you too. That your biggest weakness is your belief that you're strong. And I know some of you are thinking, Nick, I've struggled with inferiority my whole life. Or I always feel like insecure. Or I'm not sure I can do this and I don't know what's going to happen next year. Like I don't feel very strong. Whatever. There's a lot of us who, who, who even feel sometimes like we're not a big deal or we can't do much. But we behave like everything relies on us. We take control of every situation in our life. We do what we think has to be done, even if it's wrong and we know it. Even though while we'll say, but Nick, I feel like I feel insecure. I don't, I don't feel like I think I'm strong, but you act like you're the only one you can count on. And your behavior proves it. There's no place where you stop and you say, if I'm going to succeed, God's going to have to do the rest. Right? That, that's why he says, even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. And earlier in the passage, he says, all human beings, all men are like grass in the field. Like, look, you know, look around. Some people are younger than others. Some people are taller than others. Some people are handsomer or prettier than others. Some people are richer than others. And all that difference to God is the difference between blades of grass and a field you walk over. It makes no ultimate difference. It makes no meaningful difference to him. If you were valued by God because of your strength, you would be of no value to God. That's not why God values you. 
That's not why you're important to him. That's not why he cradles you as a shepherd close to his heart, it says in verse 11. He cares about you because you bear his image. You're his, you're his creative child, and you can be his redemptive son and daughter through Christ. It's not because you're strong. You're not strong. You and I are like grass in the field that's here one day and gone tomorrow. We're all going to die, right? I don't, it doesn't matter if coronavirus gets you or not. Relative to your strength, we're all going to die. We're all flesh. You have an organ in your body right now that's beating, and if it stops for a minute, you are gone. We are, all of us, profoundly, biologically resilient in incredible ways because God has created us amazingly, and yet we're incredibly frail. Physically and mentally? How many times do you think you've made like a rock-solid decision and it, is, it turns out to be like the dullest thing you've ever done? And emotionally, like you feel something so strongly, you're so sure you're right, and then you find out that your emotions completely misled you and you were completely disconnected from reality. We are incredibly frail. Weak in all kinds of ways. And believing you're strong might be your greatest weakness. It may be the pothole cover on the pipe of the living water of Christ actually flowing in your life and filling you with the strength of God. Think about that. Think about what Jesus, has, Jesus did in Mark's gospel. As a physician, I've come to heal the sick, not the well. Right? In order to receive Jesus' healing, you've got to admit you're sick. Right? He says to the Pharisees, because you say you can see, I can't cure your blindness. Because you have to admit that you're blind before Jesus can give you sight. For him to send you the right way, you have to be able to repent. That is to re admit you're going the wrong way so he can turn you the right way. He says in Revelation to a church, in, in chapter 3, verse 17, he says, you say, we are rich, we've gained wealth, and need nothing else. But I see that you are weak, pitiful, broken, and naked. Do you think that that church in modern-day Turkey in the first century was more financially wealthy than us? That believed that their wealth could buy them health and happiness more than us? Because I think that would be delusional. Because of our wealth, because of our health, because of our technology, because of our orderly government, because of all these sorts of things, we believe we're strong. We believe we can solve our problems. We believe we can handle things. We think about that. That's what we think of. That's what we wait on. That's what we hope in. And Jesus says to his people, he wants to say to you, your greatest weakness is your belief in your strength. You think that you're wealthy. You think you, you don't need anything. And I'm telling you, you're weak, you're lost, you're broken, and you're naked. And I cannot fix any of those things until they're admitted. And I cannot, I cannot provide strength in the vacuum of that weakness until you embrace the reality of that weakness. And that's what he says. In contrast to the youth that can stumble and the young man who grows, will grow weary, he's like, but those who wait upon the Lord will, and the Hebrew word literally means change their strength. Those who wait on the Lord will, and the clothes, that'd be like changing clothes. Like you take off something, you put on a new outfit. It's renewed in the sense that it's changed, right? They'll renew their strength, but they're, really they're changing their strength. That is, that is you are getting rid of your belief in your strength. You've got to get rid of that. You have to let it go. You're like grass. You're going to burn up in the field. You're going to die in a day. You're not strong mentally, physically, humanly. There's nothing strong about you. You're weak, and only in reveling in that weakness can you receive the strength of God. That's ex exactly what the Apostle Paul says, right? He says in chapter 12, he says, he said, I, in this thing I was suffering, I asked God to take it away, and God said, it is in your weakness that my power is made perfect. And then Paul says to the Corinthians, don't you see, when I am weak, then I am strong. God's desire for you and I, and there's no better moment to think about this than Christmas Eve, for us to experience the rivers of living water, the, the free gift of the power and strength of God to soar like we have eagle's wings emotionally and spiritually over all the difficulties and troubles of our life, to be like Mary, to be able to treasure up in our hearts even the swords that will pierce them. That only comes in the humble, reality-hearted believer who in real faith can see their weakness and so open themselves entirely to God's strength. That is the only way God offers his strength. 
Any other road leads to spiritual exasperation. How can God show that he's more committed to that than the Almighty One becoming a baby? How could he possibly do it? How could he possibly show how committed he is to strength through weakness, life through death, riches through poverty, than for the, the eternal son to become a baby and then to be humiliatedly murdered on a cross. And through those human frailties to save the human race for everyone who would admit their weakness enough to believe. I don't know of a way. I don't know of any way that could possibly happen. And so on the night when we remember Jesus in his second most frail human position, let a door swing open to you that in acknowledging your weakness with him as a fellow human, that that is the gateway to God's strength. The poverty of that, the gateway to God's riches. The mortality of that, the gateway to God's immortality. And the seeming stupidity of that, the gateway to seeing God's wisdom. Stop believing in yourself as you believe in him. And let that be the gateway to a strength from God that will carry you like eagle's wings over whatever comes. God, as we sing these other songs, as we light candles recognizing that you're the light of the world, as we meditate tonight and tomorrow on the beauty of the incarnation of the Son, let this be a moment where we open ourselves to you in a way in which you can rush in with a new spiritual strength that can carry us through whatever it is we're going to face and can rejuvenate us in a weary state. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.